So, um, good morning, everyone. Um, for the second day of the uh, of the Kutla Fest, and good morning to the one to everybody joining us from North America. Good afternoon to all Europeans, and good evening to all of you who are joining us from from Asia. Um, we had a spectacular day, first day yesterday, with four beautiful talks, and um, I challenge today's speakers to, to match this, and I'm sure they will have no trouble doing so, is I think we are in for um, an exciting second day of the conference, and our first speaker is Jörg Kramer from Berlin, and he will talk about subnorm bounds for Siegel modular forms. Yeah, thank you, Jens. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizer for inviting me and giving me the opportunity uh, to contribute uh, to this distinguished uh, event, the Kudla Fest. So, I mean, I possibly will not match uh, the, the hurdle that uh, uh, Jens said, so to say, but I'll try my best uh, not to be too much below it, so to say. So uh, I think I have no photos uh, of Steve's. So I'm sorry for not providing any pictures uh, of his uh, related to myself, uh, but I have very fond remembrances. And uh, yesterday after uh, Dick Gross's fantastic talk as usual, fantastic. Uh, so, so this I can never match, so to say, by the way. So um, I started to remember myself a little bit how I got to know Steve. And uh, it, was, uh, it was 1985 when I got uh, to Harvard in the fall as a postdoc with a fellowship from Switzerland. And uh, uh, I frequently exchanged with Dick Gross at the time uh, when he was there. And at some point he just mentioned Steve and he said, why, why don't you uh, get together with Steve at some point in time and apparently he has contacted Steve immediately and uh, in the same immediate way I got a reply from from Steve who invited me down to uh, College Park and that's how it started uh, uh, that we got to know know each other and at the time somewhat mathematically quite unrelated so to say but anyhow but then a few years uh, later uh, with Ulf's Kuhn, Ulf Kuhn's thesis, and then the subsequent joint work with Jose Burgos, uh, we were able, and that's what I'm happy about, at least to provide some mathematical stuff that was useful in, in uh, Steve's work, so to say. So today I will not talk about this because, as you might know, we're still working on the, so to say, mixed Shimuba variety stuff related to our kernel theory. And we have tons of notes, uh, but the pandemic hindered uh, Jose and myself to really sit down and write stuff up, so to say. So we have hundreds of pages. And yesterday, we had the plan that we definitely try to meet in the fall in Madrid again and to start writing up these things. So that's why uh, I uh, talk about another topic. But as you will see in a moment, this topic is also slightly related to Steve's work. So. Well, well, now it seems not to move anymore. Now it moves, so it was frozen for a moment, like Dick's uh, screen yesterday. Yeah, supernorm bounds on average in the elliptic modular case. So at some point in time of my life, I never thought I, got I will be interested in this topic, so to say. But then, uh, as you know, one never should say no. And uh, well, now I explain why I got interested in that. So we have the usual notation, the upper half plane denoted by H, Z, X plus I, Y, Y positive. We take any function subgroup of the first kind in SL2R, and we fix a fundamental domain. And we let S2 gamma denote the C-vector space of cusp forms of weight two for gamma. And with respect to the Peterson inner product, we pick an orthonormal basis, F1 up to FD. And then we can uh, form this uh, gamma invariant uh, property uh, quantity sum over this orthonormal basis absolute squared times y squared by the imaginary part of z uh, sum j from one up to d 
uh, somewhat called also the Bergman kernel in more sophisticated terms. And uh, then I explain in a moment why this quantity was somewhat uh, of interest to certain people. And uh, then to, together with a, a nice uh, paper with Jay in 2004, which appeared in GAFA, well, we, we proved some kind of uh, optimal bound of this uh, quantity. So you fix a function subgroup of the first kind gamma zero, and you, you, you consider subgroups of finite index gamma, and so to say, think of gamma varying. And then uh, we, we proved that this uh, uh, super, this, uh, the supremum as Z runs through a fundamental domain of this uh, Bergman kernel uh, can be bounded like O of one. O, or the O uh, implied constant dependent on the fixed group uh, you're working in, so to say. And now I just want to explain why can one be interested in this uh, topic? Well, the point is on, on the upper half plane, you have two distinguished metrics. Uh, we know all the hyperbolic metric, which is given like uh, dx dy over y squared and the canonical metric. Uh, the canon canonical metric is the metric which involves such an orthonormal uh, basis as I just picked it before in the weight two cusp forms. And then uh, you divide by the genus uh, associated to the corresponding modular curve. And if you just now take the ratio of these two metrics uh, up to this uh, one over genus factor, you get the Bergman kernel, so to say. Okay, so that's uh, some kind of a, a metric uh, interpretation of this quantity, but the point is this quantity then occurred uh, by in uh, the goal of estimating certain quantities which arise in Arakelov theory. And for example, it uh, was necessary to give uh, uh, sharp bounds on this quantity, for example, to compute, to estimate the faultings height for families of modular curves, say for the congruent subgroup when n is going to infinity, or then similarly uh, for giving uh, asymptotic uh, expressions for the, for, for the height of the modular curve as n goes to infinity. So that's why uh, this was the source of motivation, how I got to this uh, problem, because I was interested in the Arkelo theory and wanted to calculate uh, uh, things like heights and faulting's delta function for such modular curves and giving, because it's difficult to estimate, you're happy that you get some asymptotic expression for these guys. And that's how we got interested into this topic. And uh, then uh, it was uh, for Steve's 60th birthday, and here is the volume edited by Jim, Jens, uh, Michael Rappoport, uh, Tong Hai Yang. And their uh, contribution of Jay's and myself uh, was uh, again this topic, but with a different proof than the, the very elementary proof that has been given in the Gaffer paper. Uh, there we give a proof expressing these subnorm quantities or this Bergman kernel in terms of special values of various Eisenstein series. I mean, everything in the two, uh, one dimensional setting, so to say classical Eisenstein series but then what uh, Steve uh, calls hyperbolic and uh, similarly elliptic Eisenstein series. So we revisited this topic and uh, we, uh, this was our contribution to Steve's uh, 60th birthday in this birthday volume. And that's why I thought it's, it's not completely inappropriate now to talk again about this topic in higher dimensions uh, today. So yeah, so let me just uh, then continue the one dimensional story, complete the one dimensional story. So after Jay and myself have been uh, satisfied with our result for weight equals two, then we thought, well, we might consider the same quantity uh, for uh, weight k cusp forms, so k even. And again, you take an orthonormal basis of the weight k cusp forms, make the corresponding quantity, which I now, now denote B sub k, up uh, gamma, upper gamma of Z, uh, this uh, again, this kind of uh, weight K Bergman kernel. And then we want to know, of course, uh, the behavior in K as K gets to infinity, tends to infinity, and of course also uniformity bounds. And then uh, I just state here uh, the two results uh, which express the dependence on K of this quantity. This was jointly with uh, Jay and uh, 
George Friedman uh, and appeared about 10 years later. And there some phenomenon occurs uh, in, the, in the K behavior, so to say. So if the group is co-compact, then you get uh, linear dependence on K. However, if it's only co-finite but not co-compact, then you have to pay a price when you approach the cusp and the price is square root of K so that you only get uh, K to the three halves as optimal bound. And you can show that this is optimal, so to say. And uh, I have not noted uh, down this year, we also have this type of uniformity bounds that if gamma is varying within a fixed function subgroup, then you also have this type of uniformity results, which I just mentioned uh, on the previous slide for the weight K equals two Ks. I just wanted to focus here on the weight, uh, on the K dependence, so to say. Yeah, and that's basically now uh, the story I want to talk about uh, in higher dimensions. But bef before we go to higher dimensions, just let me uh, briefly illustrate how the ideas of proof went. Well, we somewhat relate uh, the, the cusp forms with, with somewhat mass forms. Uh, so we let V sub K denote the space of functions uh, with this uh, transformation behavior, or oh, here is a determinant, which shouldn't be a determinant, that's a typo, should just be zz plus d, but it's not wrong, I think, uh, that zz bar plus d to the minus k over two. Uh, and uh, then you pick the ones that have finite uh, uh, norm, which becomes a Hilbert space. And within that Hilbert space, you have a dense, uh, uh, set of smooth functions where you comply this weight k Laplacian. And uh, then uh, the consequence is if you take such a function, which is an eigenfunction of the uh, weight k Laplacian, that is to say a mass form of weight k over two, so Laplace k phi equals lambda phi, then the, 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 the lower part of the spectrum, the, the bottom part of the spectrum is k times two minus k or four. And so uh, as the next step, you, you, you see that you can identify the weight k cusp forms uh, with uh, the eigenspace of, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the spectrum, so to say. So you have this isomorphism between the space of cusp forms and the kernel of Laplace minus k times two minus k over four, simply by sending f to f times y to the k over two. So then you see, well, you look at the heat kernel for this weight k Laplacian, and then you basically see that you're uh, that, uh, and you look at uh, the, you look at the heat kernel and its spectral expansion on the diagonal, and then you basically see that up to, the, up to this exponential factor, which you see here, that this then is part of the, yeah, that the Bergman kernel is part of the spectral expansion, so to say. And therefore, you see, if you ignore all the other terms in the spectral expansion, uh, that this quantity is bounded by the heat kernel on the diagonal, so to say. So if you want to bound the left-hand side, you have to bound the heat kernel, so to say. You get rid of the T by some uh, simple integration over T, so to say. You get uh, rid of that. So we ignore maybe the T, so to say. Uh, so we are really down to bounding the heat kernel. And now bounding the heat kernel, uh, you have to have a, well, you have to have a formula for the heat kernel. And in dimension one, this is somewhat easy. Uh, this is the heat kernel, so to say, uh, on, on the upper half plane. So if you think you have two points Z and W on the upper half plane at distance R, then the heat kernel for these two points at distance R is given by this kind of uh, complicated formula. Well, some factor out from the integral and then you integrate from R to infinity with the integration variable rho. You have the usual rho minus E to the minus rho squared over 4T, square root cos rho minus cos R. And then, you have this crucial uh, factor which takes care of the weight, this, uh, which is a Chebyshev polynomial of cos rho over two divided by, by cos r over two. Okay, so we keep in mind, we have this kind of correcting factor. So if you wait, work with the weight zero Laplacian, so to say, if you work with functions, you don't see this Chebyshev polynomial because it's not there. Uh, so that's the correcting factor to take care of the weight, so to say. So now, uh, the, the heat kernel now of weight K for the group gamma is just obtained 
by averaging over the heat kernel on the upper half plane in this in this manner as it's depicted here. So you have two points in Z and to Z and W and H, as mentioned before. You have the T variable. Uh, you, you you think that R is the distance from Z to gamma W, and then uh, the heat kernel. Uh, K index K upper gamma, T Z W is the sum gamma and gamma. Then you have these two automorphic factors to the uh, K over two. And then you have this uh, just heat kernel, which I defined up above, so to say. So that's the formula. And uh, of course, bounding the things you bound by the triangle inequality, then these two guys go away. So you're basically down to bound the sum gamma over gamma of this quantity. Of course, you have to uh, check that this makes sense. and uh, the crucial thing is that you uh, have a bound somewhat elementarily found for the, this uh, Chebyshev part, which uh, gets into the expression for the weight K heat kernel. So you plug this in. And then uh, basically it's a more or less straightforward uh, uh, bounding of, of the remaining quantity. I mean, as I said, you kick out the T dependence by integrating it out. Uh, and then you plug in this uh, star inequality, uh, go to the diagonal, use a counting function argument to replace the sum, and then you arrive uh, at the desired bound. And a little bit uh, more involved in the cofinite setting, uh, because what you do is then, as usual, you just uh, take off uh, epsilon neighborhoods around the cusps. And then uh, the complement is a compact portion. To this compact portion, you can apply the previous bound. So you're just down to bounding things in the cuspidal neighborhoods. And in the cuspidal neighborhoods, uh, when you do the refined analysis, you see, you look at the sum there over the group gamma, and you see the contribution from the parabolic to the cusp in question contributes this kind of additional square root of k uh, component, which adds uh, then together to this uh, claimed uh, k to the three halves uh, bound in this cofinite but not co compact uh, case, so to say. So that's roughly speaking the outline of the proof, uh, somewhat elementarily. Of course, you have to do a little bit of calculations, but uh, it's somewhat doable. And uh, so uh, we were quite happy about this. And then, well, at some point I thought, uh, uh, we should try to do the same thing for higher dimensions. And that's what I want to report about because I then uh, assigned this uh, to one of my students, Antarit Mandal, uh, that, that is mentioned on the first slide. Uh, and uh, he started to work on that. And I wanna report now about the outcomes. Okay, so now here are the standard uh, notations, uh, the Siegel upper half space, uh, symmetric uh, complex matrices decomposed in real and imaginary part with imaginary part positive definite. Siegel upper half space of degree n. We have the symplectic group, which I write as sp index n, not 2n. Forgive me for that. Uh, uh, the 2n by 2n matrices, uh, which have this invariance property, in the matrix G transpose Jn G equals Jn, where Jn is this uh, 2n by 2n matrix, matrix uh, depicted down below. E sub n is the, n, uh, the nth identity matrix, so to say. And uh, we are explicitly, if you write uh, the matrix G in block form A, B, C, D, n by n matrices, you have these usual relations. I mean, the last one is somewhat uh, familiar that the, the determinant should be one, then A transpose D minus C transpose B equals E n, okay. And then uh, we have the usual fractional linear transformation action of the symplectic group on the Siegel upper half space. And we have this invariant volume measure uh, mu sub n, which replaces the mu hype uh, before on the upper half plane. Now here I write z as z j k, the components with uh, x j k and y j k, uh, the real and imaginary part of these entries of uh, capital Z. Okay, I think this is pretty standard. Then we have the continuing standard notations. You take a pick an arithmetic subgroup, a single modular form uh, for gamma of weight k of degree n is then a holomorphic function, which has this transformation behavior that f uh, 
at AZ plus B, CZ plus D inverse times the determinant CZ plus D to the minus K. So very classical modular form with regard to the determinantal representation is F of Z for all elements in gamma and some growth condition is if the cusp is, uh, if N is one and uh, SKN of gamma then is the C vector space of Siegel cusp forms of weight K and TDN for gamma. And we have the Peterson inner product uh, here uh, on this uh, with regard to this uh, invariant metric, uh, which is written here. And now, of course, you can again uh, take an orthonormal basis with regard to the Peterson inner product of this uh, space of cusp forms. And as in the elliptic modular case, uh, you then form the Bergman kernel. Uh, now, y to the k is replaced that determinant of y to the k. And uh, of course, uh, since this is invariant, it suffices uh, to uh, look at it on a fundamental domain, which I denote again f gamma. And uh, of course, we are interested in, uh, in upper bounds for this uh, Bergman kernel, so to say. So that's uh, exactly the same slide as in the one dimensional case, only that I have replaced the small z's by capital z's, basically. So uh, then, I mean, if you just look at the results from the one dimensional case, then you're led to the following two conjectures, so to say. Well, uh, if the group is co compact and the weight is bigger or equal than n plus one, because in the uh, one dimensional case, k was bigger or equal to two, and even, as I said, uh, then uh, you are led to the conjecture that uh, the soup of this uh, Bergman kernel when Z ranges over the fundamental domain is like K to the N times N plus one over two. Because if you plug in N equals uh, one, uh, then uh, you just get linear in K, so to say. And I mean, of course, the N times N plus one over two is not uh, coming out of the blue. It's of course the dimension of the Siegel upper half uh, 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 space. And uh, maybe not as straightforward, but uh, in the co-finite but not co-compact case, uh, you then expect uh, the exponent replaced by 3n times n plus 1 over 4, which gives the three halves in an equal uh, one case, so to say. Okay, so uh, that's what the, the out, uh, what, what the start is. And uh, well, what, what uh, have we found, so to say, uh, well, if the subgroup is co-compact, K again, bigger or equal than N plus one, the conjecture one holds for N equals two, and one can show more generally if a certain Chebyshev type inequality as I depicted it in the uh, one dimensional case holds, uh, then uh, it holds for all N. And I will come to that point towards the end of the lecture, what I mean concretely by that. And we have the similar result for the cofinite case that, that the uh, conjectured inequality, the conjectured uh, upper bound holds uh, for n equals one and two. Uh, and it holds in general if we again have the same type of equality, which I mentioned be, uh, later on, if this is valid, so to say. Let me mention. Uh, just uh, uh, two people who have worked in that uh, business, but this is completely uh, incomplete. What I'm mentioning is I just would like to mention Jim here, Jim Cocktail, who has unconditionally shown conjecture one for the group gamma. Uh, so uh, in our results, uh, uh, gamma is arbitrary arithmetic subgroup. Uh, Jim has focused on SPN, Z. And uh, he needs, if I have read correctly, assume that K is bigger than 2N, in fact. I mean, for N equals, well, for N equals 2, it plays also a role, it's a slight role, but not significant. Uh, and then there are people, of course, in the analytics number theory crowd uh, that uh, look at optimal subnorm bounds for individual Siegel modular forms, usually Hecke eigenforms. And the Valentin Blomer showed optimal bounds of the type uh, conjectured uh, when the Siegel modular form arises uh, from below, so from a lower dimensional uh, elliptic modular form via Ikeda lift. So this is just a, a relation to other re results, but uh, let's now uh, uh, do in the second half of the talk, uh, the strategy of proof. And you will see in a moment 
it starts, it goes along, uh, we try to mimic the one dimensional case. And I mean, you can anticipate, uh, I mean, this I can say at this point in time, you anticipate that the, that the crucial ingredient will be that you get your hands onto the heat kernel when you arrive at the heat kernel at some point in time. Okay, so let's uh, now do our, uh, our uh, walk uh, to that heat kernel. So, so the first part is somewhat uh, quite light. Uh, well, just replace little letters by capital letters. So we have this uh, uh, analog of the space of functions we had before. Now the determinant definitely is used. So this uh, kind of uh, uh, mass forms. So, but just the space of functions with this invariance property as uh, depicted on the slide here for all elements in gamma. Then you take the ones which are bounded uh, norm. And then uh, you have a, a, on a, on a dense subspace uh, consisting of smooth functions uh, of bounded norm, you have this Laplace operator acting. So uh, within the trace, you have this matrix value differential operator and then you take its trace and that's the replacement for our weight K Laplace we had in the one dimensional case. You see it's quite, looks like as before, right? If you in, are in the one dimensional case, you see the minus Y squared times D two by DX squared plus DY by DY squared minus or plus uh, I K Y D by DX. Okay, so that's our Laplace of weight K we're dealing with. And then you realize, uh, of course, it's a little bit a messy calculation, but it's somewhat contained in mass, basically, that uh, uh, if you take an eigenform, uh, an eigenform, which is then a mass form of weight uh, k over two of degree n for gamma, then its uh, lowest eigenvalue is n times k times n plus one minus k over four. So that's the quantity we had before, before we had k times two minus k over four, so to say. And then similarly as before, you, you find that the uh, space of uh, cusp forms of weight K and degree N for gamma can be identified with the eigenfunctions at the, uh, at the, with the eigenspace uh, for the lowest eigenvalue. And again, the assignment is the same thing. You just assign to F, uh, F times the determinant K over two. And then this tells you if you think of the heat kernel attached to this uh, uh, weight K uh, Laplace operator of degree N. If you think of that heat kernel and think of its spectral expansion, well, th think of the co-compact case if you want, then uh, you look at this spectral expansion, then of course you see that uh, the portion which I have written at the very bottom of this slide, this is the first part of the, this is the first part of its spectral expansion. And again, you see as before up to this exponential factor, which takes care of the time variable, that this, that, that, that this guy, uh, Bergman kernel, which consists of the quantity we are interested, or whose size we are interested, uh, concern at the, uh, in the spectral expansion of the heat kernel. And if, since we are on the diagonal, uh, we can every other uh, summon this positive and we just neglect it. And that's why we get uh, this inequality, so to say. So uh, here, here we go. Here you see, uh, in order to be able to get your hands uh, in terms of bounds on this Bergman kernel, you have, uh, you have to get your hands on this uh, heat kernel. Of course, then you have to know what the heat kernel is. And uh, I think that's possibly what we're now uh, using uh, some time for, so to say. So this takes a little bit of time. And I think the next, uh, yeah, the next part of the talk is devoted to give you some kind of a feeling how you can get your hands on to this heat kernel. Of course, lots is known, but lots is not also written up, so to say. Uh, and that's why one has to go through all these uh, things. So uh, let's just do a slide with uh, some Lie algebraic notation uh, in this context, which is simple. So we have the, uh, uh, the, the, the SPN uh, as a Lie group, so to say. So with the Lie group of SPN. And this, this is just the set of these matrices, A, B, C minus A transpose, where A, B, C are N by N matrices with real entries, such that B is symmetric and C is symmetric. And uh, then you have the usual standard carton 
involution on this Lie algebra just by transpose by minus transposition and uh, taking the plus and minus subspaces of this uh, map, you get uh, the Carton decomposition of G0 into K0, standard notation, and P0. And within P0, you have a maximal abelian subalgebra given by the diagonal matrices, uh, which are written in this way, uh, R0, 0 minus R, where R is the uh, n-dimensional diagonal matrix with little r1s up to rn's in the diagonal, and Rn being Rj being real numbers, so to say. Okay, now you take the exponential map of everything, and then you get down to the Lie group, the top side. So G0 now is uh, our SPNR we had before, and the K0 is the exponential of the K0, which now is, uh, so to say, the orthogonal matrices in G0, so AB minus PA. And if you want, you can also rephrase it that A plus IB is unitary, N by N matrix. And uh, then uh, we get to the torus by exponentiating this uh, frac A0, uh, which is then simply E to the R, 0, 0, E to the minus R. So all these diagonal matrices in uh, G0 uh, that are have uh, non-negative, uh, non well, positive entries, I should say because I exponentiated the real numbers R1 up to Rn, so to say. Some, maybe just some, some kind of a remark. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, classically you normalize by dividing maybe R over two here. Uh, that's, uh, that has just a phenomenon that you will see at the end. All my formulas at the end will have a factor two out front. It has the advantage that uh, uh, subsequently in the middle, the formulas need not to have this division by two, which makes the formulas a little bit lighter since they are heavy enough. So uh, it's a little price with the one dimensional case you will see at the very end, but I think it's, it's uh, digestible, so to say. Well, this decomposition, I mean, the A component, A zero component is not, not unique in this uh, decomposition. If you decompose a matrix, you know, this is unique up to conjugation by the Weyl group. And uh, last not least, of course, you, well, you know the well-known uh, uh, identification of the symmetric space Hn as the coset space K0 by the maximal compact K0, just by uh, letting the coset G uh, with uh, K0 correspond to G acting on I times the identity matrix of uh, size N, so to say. Okay, so now, we go slowly uh, on our way to, to construct uh, the heat kernel of weight K. I mean, that's the main title of the slide, but the subtitles are, we go via the weight zero uh, kernel. And as you have seen in the one dimensional case, there was this correction factor given by the Chebyshev polynomial. And basically what we are doing here, we're trying to construct this heat kernel ignoring for the moment this uh, weight K aspect and ignoring, so to say, this analog of this Chebyshev polynomial, so to say. Okay, so, so we first focus on the standard Laplace operator, so to say, of weight zero in degree N and for the group gamma. And this is as usual uh, obtained by periodizing uh, over the, the heat kernel of weight zero on the upper half plane. So the same picture as, if, as in the one dimensional case, you remember the heat kernel for the group gamma was obtained by averaging over the heat kernel on the upper half plane. So to say this exactly the same picture. And by the way, I forgot to say this, I should have said this at the very beginning. Uh, I, I, of course, I was aware of the fact that the uh, theta function should be in, in, in the talk, so to say. But I think everybody agrees that heat kernels are somewhat theta functions. So uh, that's why the theta functions are all over the place here. So, so the theta functions are all also there, but I haven't written it down, but they are, they are definitely there. Okay, so you know the, our heat kernel, uh, which is in the game, we have it on the diagonal, consists uh, uh, of such a sum. And of course, now, of course, everybody says, now I have to know this heat kernel on the upper half space, so to say. And uh, for simplicity, like in the one dimensional case, I've done it. I reduced to the case uh, 
uh, to explain this formula for you uh, when uh, Z is uh, by the double transitive action of the symplectic group transformed to the point uh, imaginary unit times uh, size n unit matrix and uh, W is uh, thrown to this uh, matrix I times E to the two R. The R is this uh, N by N matrix uh, with little r1 up to Rn on the diagonal and then you apply this fractional linear transformation to it and uh, then you get uh, this. Okay, so uh, so that's what I want to tell you. What is this quantity? How does this quantity look like? Okay, so now with this little bit of uh, uh, input of linear of uh, Lie algebra we had at the beginning, uh, we start again with uh, the identification of the Siegel upper half space with the uh, coset space G zero modulo the maximal compact K zero with the correspondences I mentioned just before. So K zero corresponds to uh, imaginary unit times uh, identity matrix of size n and the e to the 2r simply corresponds to this guy, e to the r, the coset of e to the r in the coset space. And now I give you a formula where you see, I don't know the left-hand side, I don't know the right-hand side, okay? So it's not a lot of much inside what I'm giving you here, but I promise you we will work on the right-hand side and then at some point uh, in time, the right-hand side will become transparent or more, at least more transparent, hopefully. Okay, so left-hand side is basically uh, speaking in one-dimensional terms is the heat kernel on the upper half uh, plane uh, for points at uh, hyperbolic distance R, so this, or 2R, I should say here. Here is the 2R effect. You see, if I had normalized with R over two here, uh, then this was going to be an R. Okay, so that's a little price, but oops, it's doing not what I should, it should do. Okay, so that's the formula. That's the formula I can find that the heat kernel uh, here in this in these terms on the Siegel upper half space for the weight zero Laplacian is given by an integral over the dual space of this uh, frac A zero. So you integrate over the linear functionals on this A0, D lambda. And then you have an E to the lambda index omega T. So that's the T dependence uh, of the whole story. And then you have phi lambda, a so-called spherical function, which is defined on the coset space G0 modulo K0. And then you have the C lambda absolute square to the minus two, the so-called Harishchandra C function, so to say. So phi lambda is a spherical function. I do not go too much into detail for that. I just say it's an eigenfunction of the zero, uh, weight zero Laplacian with eigenvalue lambda omega. And on the next uh, three slide, on the next two slides, I tell you what lambda omega is to make it more concrete and what uh, for SPN R, uh, the Harish Chandra C function is. And then of course it boils down to know this uh, spherical function phi lambda, so to say, to make things more explicit. So the, so the first part is now the lambda omega, uh, which we simply uh, obtain as follows. Maybe I can show all the slides here. So we have this uh, frac A0, uh, so to say the logarithm of the torus, if you want. And we take just the dual basis uh, in this uh, space of linear functionals of frac A0, uh, evaluated at our matrix capital R zero zero minus R that it uh, uh, spits out the, the RJ coordinate, so to say. And then writing uh, our uh, lambda general linear functional on frac A, there should be a zero here, sorry, I forgot this A zero. As uh, we expanded in terms of this uh, basis, A1, E1 up to EN with coefficients lambda one up to lambda n, then the lambda omega is given by this formula. So, so you see in terms of uh, the integration variable lambda, which is lambda one up to lambda n, you have this uh, explicit formula for the eigenvalue. Uh, so uh, this is making the pre this formula just uh, more concrete. So now we know, so there's an integral of d lambda one up to d lambda n, and now we have an explicit formula on this 
piece. And similarly, we'll get immediately a formula for this guy here. So uh, yeah, here is the formula. I do not go into detail. We have an explicit formula in terms of these integration variables, lambda one up to lambda j, so to say. So that's, uh, that's the formula. And well, by the way, I don't really need uh, the, uh, the Harish Chandra C function, but I just wanted to show that everything can be made explicit. But now comes the interesting part. How do we get our hands on this spherical function, so to say? And this is done by the Flensted-Jensen formalism, going from the real point, so to say, to the complex points. So, so that's why I put now, uh, I, that, that's why I used indices zero uh, to refer to the real uh, points. And now uh, I put G, the complex points of the, uh, of the uh, symplectic group, K now to be S, B, and C intersected with the complex. Uh, so these are the complex orthogonal matrices. And then the unitary uh, symplectic matrices is U, so to say. So then Flensted Jensen uh, related the spherical function on the coset space in the real setting, G0, G0 mod K0, to the, it's just one line below to the corresponding spherical function in a complex setting. And the point is, again, that might look uh, not a big deal, so to say, I mean, with regard to uh, helping us to get to a reasonable formula. But the point is, this uh, now uh, depicted uh, spherical function on the, on the complex coset space G mod U, this has an accessible formula. I do not write it down. Uh, I just give you then the incarnation on the next slide, what it boils down to our formula, but at least that's what uh, the use of it. The price to pay is of course, you integrate over this uh, over these uh, complex orthogonal uh, matrices, you need uh, symplectic matrices, so to say. There's a little price to pay, but the point is you see on the left-hand side, you have the quantity we are interested in. And on the, then we just uh, replace, maybe I can go back for, for a second. So now you know the whole, whole story. We have an explicit formula for that. Now we have an explicit formula for this a guy by Flensted Jensen. There you see, we don't need really to, I shouldn't have shown you the Harish Chandra C function, but I didn't want to hide it. But then now we plug in for this quantity, the result by Flensted Jensen formalism. So we have a double integral over this uh, linear functionals and over this uh, complex orthogonal uh, matrix, symplectic matrix uh, set, so to say. Okay, so that's uh, where we are now. Okay, and uh, uh, just to save time, I didn't give you the formula of, of this, but uh, it's, it's I simply show you it's accessible. And what comes out is for the heat kernel of weight zero on Hn, now this part two is this formula, so to say, and uh, you have some ingredients here to ex be explained, but you have a, a constant depending on N, which you can compute. Then you see you have this exponential in T, J squared T over four, T to the N squared N over two. And then comes this integral over K, and you see uh, what we have done. We have the integral over the functionals on this frac A zero, and then the integral over k, we, we interchange the integrals and we integrate out the integral over lambda, so to say. So this can be integrated out. So you're left with an integral over these uh, complex symplectic orthogonal groups, so to say. And then you have this exponential. And now comes some, some rows come in. And now you, you ask yourself how I get the rows. Well, the rows arise from this, uh, arise from this formula, so to say. Uh, well, R is, so to say, referring to the hyperbolic distance now in uh, n-dimensional, uh, in, 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 well, in the Siegel upper half space, so to say. The Q is, whoops, the Q, uh, sorry. The Q is the integration variable, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, orthogonal uh, complex, so to say. And then uh, if you write Q times e to the R over two in terms of the, of the, so to, I could say, carton decomposition in the complex setting, 
which is u times a times u, u is this unitary matrix, then you can, you see and do the same thing for the uh, uh, conjugate transposed thing, then you can express this quantity in terms of this uh, unitary uh, group. And that's how the, the row comes in uh, here as, so to say, a change of variables. And then the factors epsilon and delta are completely explicit, as you can see here. Uh, so the first the epsilon of rho is simple, and the delta of rho is cinches. So it's a pretty explicit formula. It's pretty, still a nasty integral, but uh, OK. It's, it's at least, uh, it looks that you might put your hands on this, onto this formula. And, and now, uh, uh, jumping from weight zero to weight k is the phenomenon as we had it in the one-dimensional setting. Well, you simply put in your favorite Chebyshev. Well, now the Chebyshev is different. It's a determinant of this. I cannot depict it nicely. Well, I just show it to you. It's this guy here, the determinant h of q to the 2k. And this h of q, you, you get as follows. It's an n by n matrix. You write your integration variable q as q0 times qh, which q0 in k0. And then qh turns out to be Hermitian ab minus ba. And then h of q is a plus ib. And you take the determinant, raise it to the kth power. That's your Chebyshev in the one dimensional case. So uh, that's now the heat kernel. And now we come to the end of the talk. And uh, well, uh, I just assemble briefly in the on the last slides uh, together uh, the essential things we, we had uh, accumulated so far. So uh, yeah, from the spectral expansion of the heat kernel, we arrived at this uh, crucial equation involving the heat kernel on the diagonal. Then uh, we had our heat kernel uh, on the diagonal, which looks like this. And now, uh, if we look uh, at uh, this heat kernel and make this uh, change of variables, of course, now the, the, the R, of course, depends on the gamma, which acts on here. Of course, this is not independent. Uh, you have the, this formula, so to say, uh, for each summon here, so to say. Yeah, with R's, of course, depending on, on gamma. OK, so now, now you. Uh, want to estimate this. And again, here is uh, the analog of the inequality star I had at the beginning, which I called this kind of Chebyshev type inequality, which allows you somewhat to separate variables, uh, uh, namely separate the rows and the Rs, so to say. You see it's exponential k to the j from one up to n rho j bar, uh, absolute values divided by the product of cautious to the kth power of the hyperbolic distances, so to say, R1 up to Rn. And the row is as before, subject to the same relation, so to say. OK, and if you go to the one-dimensional slide, then you see it's exactly the same inequality. On the left-hand side, you have the Chebyshev polynomial. And on the right-hand side, you will find exactly the same thing. The row divided by 2 and the R divided by 2, because I have this kind of shift uh, uh, by two uh, now uh, put in to ease notation a little bit in this second part of the talk. And here is the crucial point. Uh, you remember when I talked about the statements beforehand and said uh, our results would be true uh, if a, a Chebyshev type inequality, now a star star would be valid, so to say. And the point is we can show this inequality holds, of course, for n equals one, but also for n equals two. And it turns out that it's at least the right hand side is a uh, at least the right hand side is a local maximum of the left hand side you can show by as usual first derivative zero and second derivative second derivative uh, uh, negative definite so to say by the Hessian. Okay, so we can show that, but at, we were hopeful that we maybe manage uh, after having gone through all this uh, trench war. Uh, to, to do it in general. So we're pretty optimistic that it, it, it can go through. But once you have this, you we come to the last slide, basically. It's basically now the last step. Uh, you have this kind of complicated uh, formula uh, for uh, the heat kernel. And you have here uh, this uh, time factor. Then you have this sum over gamma. And then you have this integral over 
the complex or orthogonal symplectic matrices uh, with all the notations as before. And now we have to do several manipulations. As I said, you get rid of the T by simply integrating from T from zero to infinity in an appropriate way. That's really elementary. So you get rid of the T thing. And then uh, you're down to the sum and to the integration of uh, over the complex uh, orthogonal matrices. So, so what you do first uh, is uh, you basically uh, do a, uh, as in the uh, first uh, slide shown in the first one dimensional case, you, you, you make a counting function argument uh, to perform uh, the integral over R. And then uh, you're done with the sum. And then you make a change of variables from the, from the RQ to the previous rows and the unitary stuff. And the unitary stuff, as the slide shows, is irrelevant. This integrates out easily. So you're down in, at an integral over rho. And this can be carried out and gives rise to the bounds I showed to you, so to say, in the co-compact setting. And in the, so that's what I, is just this uh, bullet point here. And of course, uh, now you have to treat the, the non-compact uh, co-finite setting. And there you do again uh, this decomposition into cospital neighborhoods and, and uh, some compact inner domain. And then again, you have to, uh, yeah, to split the sum here over the ones uh, which are not in the maximal parabolic at this uh, cusps. And, and the remaining part, the remaining part uh, uh, stays within this range. And uh, the gammas contributing to the uh, critical parabolic in question contribute to this uh, uh, factor as in the one dimensional setting. Okay, so that's, I think that's about this. Yeah, that's, uh, that gives rise to these results as I have uh, mentioned it before. And I think then I'm in time basically to finish. And Steve, I like to wish you all the best for your 70th birthday, good health, continuing great mathematical productivity, but on the side also enjoying life. Thank you very much for your attention. Um. Thank you, Jörg, for the, this wonderful talk. Um, may we thank Jörg. Thank you. Are there any questions? I, <clears throat> I had a couple, a couple of things occurred to me as you were talking. And the first is that, of course, when you go to the Siegel case there, are, uh, lots of not scalar valued and as you know, not sections of a line bundle, but you could have lots, lots of other automotive property factors. And so the natural question is what, whether you can uh, define the analogous quantity. I suppose it's, there should be some uh, analogous quantity defined for other automorphic factors and whether the techniques you're doing would go through in that situation. That would be the first question. Yeah, I, I think of course the formalism is, is quite functorial, so to say. Right. That, that it should work. But uh, of course, I was modest in trying to just do the classical, simple of course, yeah. representation case. But I think uh, if young people, uh, much younger than I am, uh, uh, can struggle with all these uh, complicated formulas, I think it's, it's doable, so to say. I, I'm pretty optimistic because it's, as you see, I, as I try to document, so to say, the, the formalism is. Is, 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 yeah, it's pretty functorial, I think. Right. And I guess along the same lines, the, the point would be that, of course, I don't know to what extent you're using the fact that the Siegel space is a tube domain. Uh, and so the point is, of course, that there's a nice classification of all the Hermitian. I mean, there's a, this beautiful book by Faro and Karani, where they mm -hmm. essentially say, well, okay, you can write down all the tube domain cases in some uniform fashion. Mm -hmm. And I would very strongly suspect that everything you're doing can be written just translating the same, as you say, almost like putting capital Z for small z, you know, yes. <laughs> you would be able to, to extract the quantities that Kaparo and Karani had, have written down in general for general tube domains. But this is quite interesting because it includes some exceptional cases in the ON2 case and so on. The ON2 case, of course, is uh, quite relevant to automorphic uh, form calculations. And so 
I, I would also guess that you could probably do something like that. But are you using the hermit, the uh, the tube domain aspect somewhere in, implicitly here? Uh, we not it's really, possible. but but no. but 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 I I would say implicitly we're using it. I would say yeah, implicitly we're yeah. using it, and I completely with you that I think uh, and this was this exercise for I think also to 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 have a to have a a model case so to say along which you can develop other other cases along the same lines because it if it broke down here of course then we would be stuck so to say right, but right. but now it makes exactly optimistic as you say uh, to go for more generality even right so for example yeah. it might be also very interesting to look at un1 which is yeah. not a tube domain where the, the sort of structure at infinity is going to be more complicated as well, right? So yeah, yeah, Fourier yeah, Jacobi yeah. coefficient expansions and so on and so forth. So yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. does that you know would that change the exponent, the k to the one half that you're getting in at infinity? Yeah. Would that change if, in this case? That's uh, well, uh, well. So so too... far in the in the co-compact setting, it, it's just uh, the, the 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 dimension which comes in. Yeah. Uh, which shows optimality because if you make a riemann roch argument, you simply integrate over this average uh, the quantity over this uh, over this uh, quantity, and then it's just a dimension which basically comes in. A dimension right. by riemann roch is like k to the n times n plus one over two. So that's why that's what you a priori will expect when you go for the co-compact mm -hmm. case. And then, as you say, interesting when you have cusps. I mean, what is the what is the increase uh, you pay? Right. So I, I have not a con I don't think I have a conceptual idea there, so to say. <laughs> anyway, those were questions that occurred. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But I mean, you see, it's it's I mean it's 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 work to do. I mean, one question, because as I said in the beginning, I, I mean at, at first sight, I didn't know why why should I go why should I get involved into that, so to say. And then our kill-off theory uh, convinced me, okay. But now it's a reciprocal question. Can this be used maybe in higher dimensional or a kill of uh, theory when you want to compute some kind of complicated uh, quantity like some height of a cycle or something? And then uh, uh, this quantity plays a role. I have no idea, I have no idea. Um, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Well, if that's not the case, um, before we thank uh, Jörg again, uh, I would like to note that while theta series did not occur explicitly in this talk, we all know that um, Steve, as a mathematician, truly enjoys a proper Lie group integration calculation. So uh, I, from that perspective, I really think that this was a wonderful contribution to uh, Steve's um, uh, birthday conference. So thank you, Jörg, again. Thank you, Jens. And with this, um, Sid has just uh, put again the, uh, the, the, the information for, to join Gathertown, and we will reconvene exactly in half an hour for Marie France's talk. Uh, Marie France, do you want to share your slides already? Ah, oh, lovely. Thank you. This is what I'm trying to do. You hear me? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, I am trying to see if I can do it. Does it work? Yes, it works. Can you just check yeah. whether you use the slides? Yes. It works. And you're yes. still recording. Oh. So you're going I'm back still and forth. recording. So, um, so what should I do? So do you just uh, go um, go say two slides ahead, whether this works? Oh, okay. So let me see. Uh, 